Good afternoon and thank you for staying with us right here on NTV Uganda. My name is Romy Bisuka. Of course, I'm coming to you yet again with another pertinent conversation right here today on the International Human Rights Day. And of course, we'd like to shine a light on the individuals who have been working in the shadows to ensure the promotion of human rights around the world. Those are the human rights defenders. In my midst, I do have Mr. Robert Archirenga. He is the Executive Director for the National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. We also do have Hassan. Hassan Shire. Hassan Shire is the executive director for Defend Defenders right there. And he's also the chairperson of the African Defenders in that regard. In our midst, we also do have Marita Mogasha. She is actually working with the Human Rights Center. She is, she is in charge of research and training with that organization. We'd like to talk about the people who have been working in the shadows. Those are the Human Rights Defenders. But first off, what is the International Human Rights Defenders Day? Yes. Robert, very good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, yes. yes. What is International Human Rights Day? Who are the human rights defenders? Bring us up to speed. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a day that was set up by the United Nations to commemorate and acknowledge the work of human rights defenders. Mm. And uh, in the understanding of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights and Responsibilities of mm. Human Rights Defenders, it defines a human rights defender as any individual mm. who, in association with others, contributes to the protection and promotion of human rights mm. using non-violence. Oh, on their own? On their own. Mm. So whatever you're doing, as long as it contributes to the protection and mm. promotion of human rights, mm. and what that you do is done in a peaceful manner, without using violence, you automatically qualify to be a human rights. What defender. is the work they engage in on a daily basis? One, it could be creating awareness, teaching people about their rights, it could be any rights to civil liberties, political rights, uh, social economic rights. If you are talking about the right to health, especially in this pandemic, maternal health, uh, the right to education. Mm. Uh, we've had children not being in school for two years. If mm. someone is talking about the effects of children staying at home, such as teenage pregnancies, that person is promoting the rights of the child, mm. the right to education. Mm. Now, that act alone qualifies him or her to be a human rights defender. Indeed. You need not to be a lawyer, you need not to be an educator, even a peasant farmer in the village. Once he or she speaks out about issues mm. to do with service delivery, because service delivery is about human rights, mm. then he or she qualifies to be a human rights defender. Indeed. And uh, human rights defenders basically can be state and non state actors. Mm. The nature or the work and nature of what the police do in this country qualifies them to be human rights defenders in spite of the fact that they also violate human rights. Because they are doing the opposite. Mm. So a human rights defender can both be a state actor or a non-state actor. Mm. And you can do human rights defending even without doing it as a full-time mm. job. may not be a full-time job, but the mere fact that you stand up mm. to talk about any injustices, the courage to come out and speak out mm. qualifies you to be a human rights defender. All right, and of course, Article 38 of the Constitution also protects all these human rights defenders we are talking about. It actually allows you to peacefully assemble or to actually influence the policies of your country. That is Article 38 of the Constitution. But do we have legislation in this country that is geared towards protecting the rights of the human rights defenders? Do we have one? We should be having one. Mm. The 10th the Parliament had come up with a bill, the Human Rights Defenders uh, Protection Bill. Mm. Unfortunately, as you know, that when the 11th Parliament came in, all bills that had been were shelved, uh, were shelved and mm. put aside. So we're trying to see how we can raise advocacy with the Parliament mm. and other stakeholders to see that this bill is uh, put back to the table to, uh, before mm. or placed in the other paper and discussed and probably it will be passed. Indeed. It's one of those recommendations that came from the Universal Periodic Review mm. to legitimize the work of human rights defenders and recognize them and protect them. Mm. Hassan Shire, I'm telling you, we have institutions in this country. You've got a Human Rights Commission. They've been aiding the work when it comes to promotion of human rights. But then how can they work with uh, human rights defenders and also civil society organizations to ensure the promotion and observance of human rights in our country, Uganda, here? We are all uh, here today. It's uh, International Human Rights Day. Mm. I want to wish the listeners and also the panel here mm. happy International Human Rights Day. Indeed. Uh, Human Rights Defenders Day we celebrated yesterday, so mm. it means the week long mm. of celebrations of Anti Corruption Day, Indeed. Human Rights Defenders Day, mm. International Human Rights Day. I want to quote one article of mm. the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Indeed. Article number one All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act toward one another in a spirit of brotherhood. 
Human rights defenders, they reinforce uh, that article and the other 29 articles whereby they strive sometime out of nowhere, as Robert mm. said that, they can emerge out of nowhere and then denounce, act to denounce violations and, 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 and work toward holding power holders mm. accountable. In doing so, there have been a long period of time when they were not recognized, as you know that the international, I mean, national human rights protection is used to stop at the national human rights institution. Mm. But human rights defenders, they didn't have any specific, I mean, uh, a law or, uh, or, or declaration by agreed by all states in consensus. But in 1998, mm. December 9, the United Nations General Assembly adopted what we call now Declaration on Human Rights Defenders, mm. which articulates some articles, you know, you said, right to uh, peaceful assembly, Indeed. association, mm. uh, expression, mm. uh, right to receive funds, Indeed. and uh, and work toward, you know, protecting each other and also protecting the communities mm. they work. So, in, in, in and also bring out issue which has not been pertinent before. Mm. Human rights defenders, sometimes they become controversial, simply because they introduce uh, a new new laws, they, they introduce new thinking of human rights protection. Therefore, you might find after 10 years or 20 years, that thinking can become a law or can become a norm in the society. Mm -hmm. But for them, they are what we call uh, uh, forerunners for protection of human rights mm -hmm. defenders. And in doing so, they face a risk, a lot of risk, as okay. I speak to you now, uh, human rights defenders in, in, in our neighboring countries, in Ethiopia, Somalia, in Sudan, in Somalia. The journalist was in, bombed in a couple of in weeks Eritrea. ago. Exactly, mm. exactly. Mm. And uh, in, in Burundi, in uh, a, a number of countries. Journalists are being jailed you, in you, China. In China. Mm. Uh, name it. From, 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 from one corner to another corner of the world, Russia mm. to Venezuela. Indeed. Uh, you find space. And this is the now defending civic space. Mm. Human rights defenders voice at the center. Indeed. Why? Because in order to defend civic mm. space, human rights defenders are first people to speak up, to give voice to the marginal communities, to their people in radio. So all the now things we are listing mm. have been curtailed, I see. space shrinking, and in <coughs> some countries, entire civic space has collapsed. So we are now going back what you call a recession of democratic space, I hear of you. civic space. Mm. And, uh, and I think now activists have to stand up all over the world in unionism because the gains we have made over the past <coughs> 30 years now in front of us mm. you may see it's slipping down. Indeed. It's slipping down. Uh, and the civic space is shrinking even farther, especially here in Uganda as of August of this very year. Hassan Shire, we did see 54 NGOs being shut down by the NGO Bureau. Well, those were human rights defenders, some of whom who were, you know, working in the areas of uh, governance and accountability. Now, they are not doing any work in that regard. So, how best can these human rights defenders, civil society organizations, work together with the government yeah. to promote the observance and promotion of human rights? You see the notion... Without of, clashing. Exactly. Mm. The notion of African government is mm. adversary to protection and promotion of human rights. Yes, sir. We disabuse it. We say this, no. Mm. The government is, a, is a, for a most human rights defender hmm. because it's them who have taken constitutional duty to protect hmm. uh, liberty, the lives and the property of everyone who lives the jurisdictions hmm. where they control. But the irony here is that uh, there, there is a set of laws which I would say that it was really good to regulate the, I mean, the sector, hmm. the NGO Act of Uganda. Hmm. But that act must be enabler rather than dis dis disabler. Indeed. So it means now if you are now short of one or two, <coughs> what you call statutory requirement Indeed. as an NGO, mm. the, the, the bureau have to give you a period of time, say you in 60 days. Not an automatic and, shot. Uh, and exactly, mm. because that shows itself uh, uh, the, the, the negative use of the law. Indeed. And those <coughs> organizations, some of them are uh, very uh, robust institutions which are part of the nation building in this country, Indeed. could have been given the time to get those papers and put their file mm. on, I mean, in, 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 in the system. <coughs> All right. uh, but now we see that, you know, Indeed. the NGOs have been uh, thrashed out, mm. you know, which, which means many people who, whom they were working for, mm. now they don't see that service. 
Secondly, there are people, Ugandan people, who mm. are working in these institutions, who are getting salaries. This Christmas, you can see that they, they will be just unemployed. So you, mm. that, that it has so many negative consequences. But one thing we have to underline mm. is that this act register a fear of all civil society organizations mm. that mm. will propel, and I think uh, Marit will um, emphasize mm. more because mm. I asked that question, mm. uh, self-censorship. I hear you on that one. And not participating in public debate. Hmm. When the debate is not participated by articulated human rights defenders and civil society hmm. organizations, excuse me, we are missing a We are going to be missing out on this journey. That is Hassan Shaya. He is the executive director for Defend Defenders, also the chairperson of African Defenders. He's saying these NGOs, upon their shutdown, they should have been given due process to actually work out some of the anomalies that uh, the NGO Bureau was fronting as a reason as to why they were shut down in that regard. He says it will only lead to the exacerbation of censorship of other NGOs who might not want to befall the same fate of their comrades when they got shut down. Let's also bring in Marie Mugasha. Mugasha is the uh, program officer in charge of research and training at the uh, Human Rights Center, where Margaret Sekaja hails from as the chairperson or executive director of the same. She's going to be telling us or give, painting a, sh uh, a light of uh, how human rights observance has been achieved right here in Uganda in the last five years, since 2016, I believe. Uh, Marita, have we made any significant progress over the last five years? Have you noted any of that progress as the Human Rights Center? Thank you very much. Mm. Um, as the Human Rights Center, mm. I must say that there has been progression mm. in terms of um, the legal and institutional framework. I see. When it comes to um, enforcement and realization of human rights mm. in the country. We see that Uganda has um, the 1995 constitution, mm. but since we are looking at the past five years, um, the Parliament of Uganda recently in 2019 passed the Human Rights Enforcement Act, mm. which actually aims at um, enforcing Chapter 4 of the Constitution. Indeed. And Chapter 4 of the Constitution um, um, enshrines the basic rights that all individuals are entitled to. So to me, that's progress uh, for Uganda to enact um, a law that particularly aims at ensuring that the Bill of Rights is upheld in the country. Mm. Um, in addition to that, we have the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act. So there are so many laws that um, the Parliament of Uganda and generally the government of Uganda has enacted to make sure that human rights in the country are observed. Uh, we see that um, Uganda still has its uh, institutions, like mm. the Uganda Human Rights Commission. We must commend the executive for... Um, appointing the new chairperson of the Uganda Ms. Human Wanga, Rights yeah. Commission. Mm. And now we see that the commission is fully constituted and they can now um, run their business as the a commission, the tribunals, we the for. investigations, mm. uh, presenting the reports mm. and all this other information. So mm. in terms of institutional and legal framework, there's been progress, though I cannot um, I share away from... Uh, 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 relating with what uh, mm. Mr. Shah has said. Mm. Some of these laws are regressive in nature. Mm. There are some negative uh, connotations in some of those laws, and yet they are supposed to really largely be enabling to... to, uh, to are to, we to noting any defenders. progress, Marita, when we are seeing NGOs being shut down? These are human rights defenders who would have aided government in its quest to actually affront the observance or promotion of human rights. Now government said, no, please, shut down, because we don't want you to look this way. Mm. Is that progress? Uh, in terms of progress, mm. that has really taken us behind All right. i must add mm. uh, much as there's been progress but it feels like we have taken five steps in front and you know uh, 20 behind you know mm. behind so we must uh, it's really a call to governments and um, to make sure especially through the national bureau for ngos mm. or the ngo bureau to make sure that they enable NGOs operate in this country and not instead stifle them or, mm. you know, um, as Hassan has said, uh, and not make sure that they are crippled. They should be given an opportunity mm. to, to put their houses in order because we have been traversing this country, I mm. must say, um, popularizing the NGO regulatory framework. Mm. And we realize that um, uh, the regulators within the districts, which is the district NGO monitoring committees, mm. um, and these committees are chaired by the CAO and other district leaders, mm. and NGO, 
NGOs in the country are mm. not aware of the regulatory framework. Mm. So you see that both the duty bearers and rights holders are not aware of their rights and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So it's very unfair for the regulator to shut them down. Um, yet people do not really know their responsibilities. Ignorance of the law is no defense, but we should be able to give people um, an opportunity, NGOs and human rights defenders alike, Monday. to be able to put their houses in order once they have the information at hand, to be able to, so that we can be able to collectively augment uh, government service delivery in the country. All right, Marita Mugashe is the program officer in charge of research and training at the Human Rights Center. Organizations like yours, the Human Rights Center, work with vulnerable people in helping them access basic human rights in that regard. Now, Talk to us about how they've been, you know, suffocated during this COVID-19 period. What is the situation of the most vulnerable people in our society now more than ever that we're talking about the suspension of the Democratic Governance Facility, an organization that was funding your NGO and others to front these basic human rights uh, services to our people. What is their situation now? The situation is not good uh, for the vulnerable mm. Uh, communities in Uganda largely and with the suspension of DGF that really has exacerbated okay. the already bad situation. Um, organizations like the Human Rights Center Uganda and other NGOs have been um, working together or getting funding from the basket fund of the democratic mm. governance facility and that fund has enabled uh, NGOs and human rights defenders across the country to train um, civil society, mm. we have trained some government institutions within JLOs. Uh, so many uh, programs have really been run by um, the funding from the Democratic Governance Facility. Mm. So with the suspension, that really uh, puts the vulnerable people in even a more, in a worse situation. So it's my call um, to the government of Uganda to really lift the suspension from DGF mm -hmm. because the vulnerable people have benefited from mm. the funding directly. Even from government DGF. itself. DGF Even government funds itself. ministries, departments, yes, and agencies. Including JLOs mm. and so many other institutions. Mm -hmm. So it's really a call to the government to lift the suspension because we have all collectively Indeed, benefited from the funding of the democratic governance facility. And mm. if um, we are all working, you know, civil society mm. and government alike, if we are all working to, to serve uh, Ugandans, because we all belong to this country, mm. we should be able to, um, to to allow this funding to come in so that we can be able to support each other and be able to um, bring the most vulnerable uh, in a somewhat better position. I hear you on that one. Let's also bring in the Executive Director for the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders in Uganda, Robert Chirenga. That issue of the suspension, how have you been handling it as the Coalition for Human Rights Defenders? Thank you, Roman, mm. for that good question. Uh, of course, we acknowledge and uh, know that uh, all NGOs mm. have to be regulated. Indeed. And therefore, we respect the regulatory body, the NGO Bureau. We know that some of our members had not fulfilled mm. uh, their obligations as per the law mm. in terms of issuing, for example, uh, submitting their audited accounts, uh, in terms of also registration processes. Licenses, indeed. Yes, mm. But then... The issue we have with the regulatory body is that in the last two years, we've been in a pandemic. So there were restrictions. Mm. Are we together? Mm. There were presidential directives that stated that you should not be able to move from point A to B. You've just stated that the DGF, the funding modality, had Indeed. been suspended. Mm -hmm. Now, that's where they get resources to hire an audit firm mm. to audit their books. Indeed. That's where they're able to get money to transport those books and bring them to the bureau. I hear you. So what we're saying that while it's the mandate of the Bureau to regulate mm. and bring uh, NGOs, away, we thought they could give them an opportunity and say, look, mm. can you show cause why disciplinary action shouldn't be taken against you since we should have received your audited reports? Mm. And then listen to their story. Due process. Due mm. process. And then they, they will be able to. But right now I know that there's dialogue between some of those members who are affected. Mm. And uh, I, I met one from Bushen yesterday who was an award winner called Mr. Lee Kakonge. He's had discussions with, uh, with the Bureau. He had originally been fined, and uh, they've sorted it out, and I think he'll be getting back his mm. license. So there's dialogue going on between the Bureau and some of those mm. members. So it's not to say that some members really uh, had obliged, uh, and remember, this is a matter before the courts, so mm. I don't want to to, be, to, mm. to to defy the, the subjudice yes. rule. Mm. But uh, I know that there has been discussions with some members who are affected. 
with the, uh, the, the Bureau and uh, I think mm. it will be sorted out. Mm. The whole issue is how can we also urge the executive to leave that suspension. Because the suspension of the DGF undermines even a country's national priorities. If you look at the National Development Plan 3, mm. under the pillar of governance, uh, of security and, uh, and governance, they talk about participation Indeed. of citizens to be able to, know, to claim their rights from right holders. Using civic organizations, civic which organizations. are being shut down. Exactly. Mm. So participation, which reinforces Article 38. Now, when mm. you suspend a funding modality, that is supposed to be promoting civic participation. Mm. You are on undermining your own constitution. You are undermining your national priorities, which are picked in the national mm. development plan. So that's where the challenge is. Mm. So we we look forward when we will see the executive maybe lift this suspension, so that NGOs can be able to participate in the governance affairs of this country. Mm. And uh, we see how we can make progress in achieving our sustainable development goals. Well, of course, the male human rights defenders have been suffering. But for the female human rights defenders, the suffering has been compounded tenfold. Yeah. How so, Robert? Yes, women human rights defenders are double disadvantaged. Mm. The act of just speaking out alone is, is something that uh, mm. society seems to, to not to appreciate. I see. So women are called all sorts of names. Uh, they are harassed. Mm. They, their families do not even provide them support because they think that uh, this, uh, because of the, the patriarchal society that we live in. I see. They don't want, they don't see a woman human rights defender like uh, my sister Yamarita mm. coming out to speak about human rights issues and they're given all sorts of name calling, they're under, uh, undermined. And of course, they are subjected to all sorts of harassment like any other human rights defender. But mm. by far, uh, they're, they're women. They, 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 there's a lot of stereotyping. Mm. You can't compare the, 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 the suffering that women human rights defenders face in comparison to their, mm. their, their, their male counterparts. All right. So, uh, so Shaya, how can coalitions like the African Defenders help our human rights defenders push their work in the promotion and observance of human rights? Because the space is already shrinking. Uh, exactly. Hmm. Uh, actually, defenders and African human rights defenders hmm. network hmm. works in opposite of these shrinking spaces. Hmm. We enable uh, human rights defenders to have uh, what we call preventive uh, protection tools, whereby they assess their vulnerability, and then, uh, the, given the situation they are working, and then they, they devise what we call a protocol on their hmm. own for their own survival. Uh, all the 54 countries of Africa, they are not in the same stage, I told you. Mm. They are right to live. Uh, uh, I mean, there are, there are some countries who are worse than, uh, than the other countries. We also do that, uh, what do you call it? Or if that fails, then we provide what we call uh, effective and, uh, uh, a quick protection system where individuals and organizations can be, can be supported mm. in order to stand on their, on their own feet from a point of risk A to a point of safety B. But also we, 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 we make uh, a complementary uh, work with the National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders, which is our, our model here in Uganda, mm. and other NGOs that are members of the coalition. We empower them in terms, of, uh, in terms of capacities to, like now ongoing, today is the last day, we have what we call a week-long uh, uh, trainings of uh, claiming spaces where individual human rights organizations and people who are attending they get tools mm. for their protection, for their security, for all that. Th those tools enable them to appreciate and work safely mm. from, the, from the regions or the sub-regions they came from. Mm. We also do advocacy, uh, both at the UN Human Rights Council and the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, mm. where we have observed data and ex data in Geneva. We have permanent office there in Geneva, mm. where the voices of sub saharan African human rights defenders are being amplified even during the COVID, when no physical participation was taking place, mm. our office was very active in linking videos of testimonies and, 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 and a statement to work with the UN Human Rights Council. Mm. You can appreciate in this part of the world, we have a nine countries, nine countries, uh, six this side, and when you add Cameroon and others, mm. but six countries in the East Africa and Horn of Africa who are under the scrutiny of the UN Human Rights Council, the premier, I mean, human rights institution mm. in the world. You can see that either they have a, a mandates on them. You, they are, they are now the, in Ethiopia now there's a call, and I think it will happen in two weeks' time uh, sooner, 
whereby the standalone panel will be now constituted. So mm. the global community have to speak about the human rights situation in Ethiopia. Indeed. It has never happened before. Mm. So you could imagine the team up in, 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 in the special repertoire mechanisms. L latest one was in Burundi, mm. another one in Eritrea, Somalia, there's IE, uh, Sudan, uh, it has only stopped it. Uh, last session hmm. and, 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 and South Sudan there are multiple mandates which is now on South Sudan so you could imagine our own human rights situation in our sub region indeed it's wanted indeed and human rights defenders they work under these conditions because they are bellwether for the violations hmm. so the attack first happens on them and then only you will see the societies which they were advocating for it's being harassed or you know the space shut it down and all that so we need to work we need to work as a region i got east africa uh african union we need to work first of all to silence the gun which mm. has been prom it was a promise it was a declaration but are we silencing the gun? In 2020. Exactly. In the 2020. <laughs> now you'll see The guns were supposed to go silent. But right now what we're seeing is an amplif amplification of the same. And, 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 and right hmm. where the African Union a political headquarter, hmm. a, a, a country, Ethiopia, is important, second largest hmm. country, guns are there. Indeed. It's a grand government. Uh, hmm. Exactly. And now that even f uh, move it to other communities, hmm. Amhara and uh, Afari hmm. and so it means that it's, 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 it's not silent. We are not, si we are not able to silence mm. the guns. Mm. The same in Mali, the same in Chad, Burkina Faso, Mozambique. Name it. Exactly. It's a hell region. Exactly. Mm. exactly. And then again, coupled with negative forces, mm. which I imagine here and there. Particularly what I'm surprised is that whenever there is a oil and gas, which is a commercial, mm. you may find be people, communities who are so peaceful. Mm. Become violent. Become violent. Because so of the minerals. I see. It, be, 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 it needs more interrogation, mm. but you know, there's a pattern which we are seeing now. Mm. But you're uh, saying it's not a coincidence. It's not coincidence, mm. exactly. So one thing I want also to emphasize is that Indeed. Uh, responsibility of the protecting the rights of citizens is, lies with the government. But when all other things fail, the government is unwilling or unable to enforce the basic rule of law. Mm. I think the regional mechanisms must be deployed. And I hear all the time President Museveni advocating for that. Mm. Standby troops mm. within the East Africa, within the Horn of Africa, mm. whereby it can be deployed to, to, to extinguish the fire. Indeed. From the source. From the source. Mm. Otherwise, you, you may see flare up of that. Mm. What, I, what gives me sleepless is that mm. 110 million people of Ethiopians, mm. if this fire is not stopping, wh where you will find them? People like, is like you, mm. me. Indeed. They need safety, they need life, mm. and they need uh, protection. I hear you, Hassan Shah. You've been working within the East African region. You've been working in Somalia, Ethiopia, the whole, whole of Africa, to be exact. Mm. You've been interacting with many of these human rights defenders. What are the most, you know, basic needs that they clamor for the most? Uh, basic needs they clamor for is acknowledgement <laughs> of, their of their work. Of their work. Mm. The, the, the important work they are doing mm. must be acknowledged and appreciated. Mm. Human rights defenders are resourceful people. They are people who, who, who work in a situation of challenge. But six, six categories we must look at very carefully because of the inherent risk they are facing over mm. and above other human rights defenders. It's the environmental and land rights human rights defenders, number mm. one, group number one. In this sub-region now, they are more under attack. Women human rights defenders, which mm. you have already mentioned. Indeed. Uh, journalists who are covering, uh, I mean, elections and others on the, on the front line. Also, they have been under attack. Mm. So the activists who are bringing issues which majority of the society may not be understanding, but they are talking about love, they are talking about equality. Mm. They are saying, we are just, just leave us alone to have our equal rights. Mm. And then you have uh, those defenders who are working in a situation of armed conflict or near conflict like in South Sudan, in, uh, in Ethiopia now, uh, in some part of Sudan. So those activists also, they are under tremendous pressure. And then you have the elections now in Africa. Mm. Kenya now will be having next year. Uganda had it. Tanzania. Elections in Africa are becoming now a, a simple exercise of civic duty to elect your representative. Mm. It, it's becoming like a war footing. 
where journalists are being beaten, mm. uh, civil society members are being... Uh, so the right to protest is being mm. curtailed. Indeed. Before, during, and after elections. Mm. That's also another area where human rights defenders, including journalists, mm. are facing tremendous pressure. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and people who stand up to, to, to make the voices of every citizen mm. of this country in different collect in, in collective ways, mm. we need only to acknowledge them. And, and Robert said, now this law, which will be which has been which will be introduced in the parliament, mm. uh, is specifically for the protection of human rights defenders. Like Ivory Coast was the first country to pass the law, ratify mm. and implement mm. a specific law, which I mean uh, guarantees the right to defend the rights of others. Mm. Burkina Faso, same, Mali. So I think East Africa, we must also step up and give uh, acknowledgement and support to the human rights defenders on the ground. All right, let's also bring in Marita Mugasha. What kind of recommendations do you have for us to see to it that uh, we ably help our human rights defenders in the country, especially the women? Talk to us about the situation for the women human rights defenders. Thank you. Um, mm. As already mentioned by my colleague, Mr. Robert mm. Churinga, women human rights defenders are at a bigger disadvantage largely because we are living in a patriarchal society. Mm. So um, some of the recommendations to women human rights defenders in the country is they must be able to come to the table and dialogue and participate uh, in capacity building trainings mm. and other programs that are designed for women human rights defenders. Mm. Uh, women human rights defenders, um, as already mentioned, still by my colleague, um, should not share away from taking um, a seat at the table. They should be able to come, speak up, and be able to have their voices heard. Mm. So it's very important for women human rights defenders to take their seat at the table, um, air out their issues, and have their issues mm. be heard. Uh, and make necessary recommendations so that they can be addressed by the necessary um, powers or duty bearers mm. that be. Um, then also by way of recommendation still to women human rights defenders, uh, maybe it's for the government mm. to support them. The constitution under article 33 um, uh, particularly and specifically spells out the rights of women and um, really um, states that the women should be protected. So with that, women human rights defenders should pick up that Article 33 of the mm. Constitution and run with it and know that the government and different uh, ministries, departments and agencies uh, really have their back and be able to also engage them and mm. dialogue and be able to have their issues addressed. And then we've been talking about the political environment, how it has made it impossible for the human rights defenders to execute their work, but largely we are also dealing with the pandemic. How, how has COVID-19 and uh, the restrictions that have come with it affected the work of the human rights defenders? COVID-19 has mm. really um, led to some of the challenges that we have already highlighted mm. in our discussion above. We see that some human rights defenders were not able to move mm. to Kampala because we see that there are multiple uh, reporting mechanisms and systems that human rights defenders and civil society in general mm. must report to. Um, NGOs are required to file with the NGO Bureau are required to file with the district NGO monitoring committees for those working in the different districts. NGOs are also required to file and report to the Financial Intelligence Authority and all these other uh, different ministries and departments within government. So because of the COVID uh, restrictions, especially on movement, um, some of the NGOs were not able to file their returns, were not able to work on their audit issues, as uh, Mr. Churinga has already mentioned, uh, among others. So as a result, we see that some of those NGO um, organizations have really been shut down. They have been suspended because they did not have an opportunity to move, for instance, from Kanungu, from Hoima, mm. to wherever, to come to the NGO Bureau here at Kingdom Kampala and other uh, NDAs to file the necessary documents. Mm. Uh, COVID-19, most of the NGOs, um, do civic awareness in form of community dialogues, community engagements, or barazas. And these barazas or community engagements really bring together uh, masses of communities. Indeed. When mobilization is done, hundreds of community members come out to really gather and be able to brainstorm, 
uh, bring out their issues because when we do these community bars as we bring together uh, duty bearers like the police mm. uh, officials from the office of the DPP uh, and other duty bearers that must hear the community's voice mm. in order for them to be able to address the community's mm. issues so uh, with the pandemic NGOs and human rights defenders have not been able to congregate and bring together the big numbers of communities mm -hmm. to be able to um, air out their views for the duty bearers to be able to address them. So as a result, you see there is um, teenage pregnancies. Uh, different media reports have really showed that there is a lot of teenage pregnancies and many other violations mm. against women. Uh, some of them have been broke, uh, beaten, limbs broken, and mm. so many other violations really to women and children especially. So the pandemic has really um, restrained the work of uh, human okay. rights defenders mm. and NGOs because ordinarily they would go out to communities and sensitize, let's do this, let's not do this. They would engage uh, duty bearers mm. uh, on different issues, but because of that, um, we see that they've not been able to do their work because of the restrictive environment. Mm. And ultimately, we have seen uh, a rise in human rights violations and abuses uh, right from home to, to, to schools for some of those who are taking their uh, children to smaller groups for studying and all that. So because of COVID, the violations have really escalated. Of course, we are talking about the International Human Rights Day. That is an event that is held to mark the anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and also to promote uh, human rights all over the world. I do have Hassan Ishaya, the Executive Director for Defend Defenders. We also have Marita Mogasha. She is the Program Officer in charge of research and uh, that is training with the Human Rights Center. We also do have Mr. Robert uh, Ch Chirenga. He is the Executive Director for the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders, Uganda. We would like to talk about the Universal Periodic Review. Yes, it is forthcoming in January of 2022, and it is coming in the wake of so many negative factors coming in from the central government. We've just come out of a, an electoral period, Robert Chirenga, where we did see 54 people being killed. Yes, that is in November of 2020. This same election saw, you know, members of parliament, some of whom were on the campaign trail, they were roughed up by members of security. You did have supporters of various politicians being roughed up, being killed, if you will. You've had many of them being abducted held incommunicado. You have the chief, um, the chief of military intelligence, Abel Kandiho, who was sanctioned recently by the United States over those orchestrations in November of 2020. They were saying that he was behind uh, the abductions of those individuals and uh, the torture of many of the suspects in their cells, personally getting involved. So in the wake of all these factors, NGOs being shut down and so forth, in the run-up to the January 2022 uh, UPR review, do you think it's going to paint a very bad picture for our country or it's going to affect our ratings as far as the Universal Periodic Review is concerned? Thank you, Ramia. Uh, you know that the Universal Periodic Review is a state-driven process. Mm. It's voluntary. Indeed. Uh, no state is forced to go and uh, participate in this process. Mm. But uh, Uganda being a member state of the United Nations, Indeed. it has to be seen as one of those civilized states that believe in the UN system mm. in terms of protecting and promoting human rights. Yes, it's true. In Genu uh, January 2022, we'll be going for the third cycle. Hmm. I think the state has submitted its report. Civil society submitted its shadow report hmm. as early as July. Hmm. There's Kevin around October, the state? Yes, October. Hmm. End of October, that's when the state also submitted its report. Hmm, I see. So I'm looking at uh, an interaction between hmm. the peers, hmm. uh, other states uh, looking at how government of Uganda has fulfilled it's voluntary pledges and uh, the recommendations that it supported mm. in terms of civil political liberties. And then we'll see how that dialogue will go. Right now, you can't predict mm. uh, how countries are going to react and how Uganda, because we c we, the report can't be accessed right mm. now. It's not a public document until it is reviewed. Indeed. So we shall only know how the government of the Republic of Uganda responds mm. to those situations that will be raised by uh, member states in Geneva about the kind of situation that you talked about Indeed. that we had. But you also must recall that uh, four days ago, I had two soldiers who were convicted Indeed. for having participated in electoral violence. Mm. An LD the number the is corporal. Yeah. Only two individuals. Two, yeah. Mm. But from media reports, you could see that there were more than two people who, no, who were involved in this election. So we would have loved to see more people being prosecuted. Mm. But also these two soldiers have uh, 
their rights as soldiers. Mm. We need to know whether really... They were uh, the ones in the, war, or they are being scapegoated. Like true, and, uh, you know, sometimes these tribunals are not public, open to the public, mm. so that you know whether this uh, follow the due process. Mm. Were they given access to their own lawyers? Were they given open opportunity to put their defence? That kind of thing. So that because uh, so soldiers, like any other citizens, are entitled to their fundamental rights and mm. freedoms. So those are the issues. But uh, we look forward to a fruitful engagement. Civil society has been engaging with different state actors in terms of. Uh, the, those uh, recommendations and what we think is on the ground hmm. and uh, we look forward to having that interaction in Geneva. Of course this is the third cycle review meaning we've gone through two, two reviews. Cycles. Now according to the assessment from those two reviews and the recommendations that came out of those two reviews yes. were they implemented? Some were imp partially implemented others were not fully implemented hmm. so that's where states hmm. are asked to to, to, to tell what are those challenges you are facing mm. that uh, don't allow you to implement these recommendations so that fellow member states can give technical cooperation or assistance to see how a country can ma make progress. Because mm. the ultimate goal of the universal periodic review is to improve on the human rights situation of a country. Mm. So it's, not, it's a diplomatic process. We are not going there to do name, uh, naming and shaming a country, no? Uh, we, they, mm. they are going to review themselves and say, okay, this is mm. what we're able to do, this is how we fulfill this. Uh, in this area, we're unable to do it because of reason A, B, C, D. And then they see how countries can cooperate under the UN framework to assist them. And as the Uganda, uh, as the Coalition for the co uh, Human Rights Defenders in Uganda here, what kind of recommendations are you putting forward to improve the human rights situation in Uganda? One, it is to do with first recognizing and mm. legitimizing the work of human rights defenders. Indeed. With the law. With the law. And two, to allow us to make use of Article 38 mm. that, op that talks about citizen participation in the governance affairs of the country. And then we can have a civil debate, civil discourse with state actors mm. on how best civil society or human rights defenders can contribute to the betterment of the human rights situation mm. in this country. Mm. So what we are asking from government, do not see civil society or human rights defenders as enemies, mm. but as, as partners mm. in terms of fulfilling our obligations under the NDP3 on the governance pillar, governance and security through participation and then we can see how we can move the country together. Robert, the continued clamp down on these NGOs operating in the spheres of governance and accountability, do you think it's going to increase cases of censorship among human rights defenders working in, two, in those two spheres, governance and accountability? Yes and no, but I think mm. what we need to do is to step up dialogue with the state. I see. Uh, civil society needs also to step up dialogue with the state because uh, we cannot work in isolation of the Indeed. state. Mm. Uh, the state, as you see, it has instruments of coercion. Mm -hmm. So we have laws. Let's try to bring out the best in those laws, work within those laws. Where we think a provision of the law undermines or is not as enabling as uh, Mr. Hassan Shire said, then we should be able to advocate to parliament and other actors and say, can you check on this mm -hmm. provision of the law? Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you cannot work in isolation of the state, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Romeo. You mm -hmm. all have to work together. The whole thing is, can the state ha be open to dialogue mm -hmm. with civil society mm -hmm. actors and not see us as enemies, as they normally call us uh, people who are advancing foreign interests, mm -hmm. but to, to see us as fellow citizens mm -hmm. who want to contribute to the betterment of our country. Uh, and of course, as Anshaya, human rights defenders are not fronting foreign uh, interests. They're not terrorists, like some government officials have branded them. They're really working to advance human rights promotion and ob observe from the areas they hail from. Isn't that right? Exactly. You hmm. know, the uh, human rights defenders are volunteer groups who have, uh, who came bravely hmm. uh, to bring uh, hmm. uh, uh, points hmm. which uh, state and other stakeholders need to understand. What comes to your mind when you hear government officials saying such and such an organization is run by terrorists <laughs> or human rights defender X I've, is a terrorist? I've, I've seen the women hmm. uh, uh, empowerment, what's the name, the, the, during the election? Woman, woman's group. <laughs> you own it. Ooh, Uganda yeah. Women's Day. Exactly. exactly. Mm. And, uh, and uh, have been leveled on that. It's a very weighted, I mean, uh, mm. uh, character assassination. And the individual concern and the organization concern, they get shivering. Mm. Because when, when, when someone, when, when, you know, the authority levels you that you are, you are, you are terrorist, mm. it's not, uh, or money laundering, or you know, there are so many I mean, uh, chapter four, uh, chapter yes. four, mm. yes. Yeah, so, so many other words. But one thing I tell you is that, and uh, Robert and uh, Marit also emphasize it, the NGO Act itself mm. is a good act with mm. good intention. Yes, sir. But the mechanisms within the act 
you have the bureau now, it's enforcer. But within, there, there are two other groups who are missing now. As we speak now, there is no board of the bureau, of the bureau hmm. have not been constituted. And then there's also another appeal group. Hmm. The education committee. Uh, education committee hmm. have to be also established. So these 54 organizations could have not lost uh, their license if those two institutions are in place. Fully but constituted. They, they, exactly. They could have appealed it. They, the, the board could have intervened hmm. and all that. Hmm. So I think fulfillment of that, as, as Marit said, that we're very happy now. The National Human Rights Institution hmm. have been constituted duly. Indeed. With a very experienced Miriam uh, as a chair who have been there in the system hmm. for, for quite some time and other able uh, commissioners. So now at least that tribunal is a functional. Other two must be, I mean, constituted as mm. well, and then so that you know we can we, we can have a recourse to whenever some challenge mm. and the conversation can be completed. Mm. But one thing I tell you is that uh, protection of human rights defenders is a primary responsibility, and I want to emphasize that mm. of the government, the 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 UDHR, and then the declaration on human rights defenders was unanimously. I, I want to I want to mm. emphasize that unanimously adopted by the General Assembly to which every country we are mentioning now were members. Hmm. It was only 98. You cannot say that it was 48. Hmm. Therefore, uh, human rights activists, human rights defenders, women's groups, all these groups must be given space to work. Hmm. All right. uh, and hmm. That is Hassan Shah, the Executive Director for Defend Defenders. Let's also bring in Marita Mugasha and get to hear the recommendations coming in from the Human Rights Center. We, it, we also in the know that uh, members of security, Marita, have not been implementing Article 38 of the Constitution. We've been seeing people who have been peacefully assembling and uh, they've been roughed up by members of security in that regard. We've also been seeing people, human rights defenders, ex exercising Article 38 of the Constitution, but still we've seen them you know get into the bad books of the government or police or security agencies in this country how else do we have to expedite an, a conducive atmosphere that will help human rights defenders work in tandem with the government to uh, increase the promotion and observance of human rights in this country thank you um, mm. we have seen those violations Indeed. as you have mentioned so for us by mm. way of uh, recommendation is continued sensitization Amazing. of the police and uh, all the other law On enforcement agencies mm. in the country because when there's uh, an issue of public order management because we have uh, when mm. there's an issue of public order management we see that uh, it's the police that's supposed to mm. enforce mm. public order management in the country but when the situation is a Exacerbated, we see that mm. um, sister agencies like uh, military UPDF. police, mm. UPDF, and all these other um, uh, security agencies coming in to support the police. Mm. And with that, we see very little accountability from the law enforcement and Indeed. security agencies mm. when violations are committed against the citizenry. Mm. So it's very important for human rights defenders, civil society, and government alike to continue sensitizing each other. I must point out that the Human Rights Center Uganda has a program where we conduct trainings for the police, mm. uh, the prisons, and all these uh, law enforcement agencies. Mm. It's funded by the Austrians. Mm. And um, we bring together the um, police and train them on some of the basic human rights um, issues in the Constitution and all the laws that they must follow. So there is need for continued sensitization. Mm. The security forces are big. Um, human rights or one, a singular human rights defending organization cannot, you know, handle mm. uh, all the security forces in the country. So it's very important for human rights defenders to work together to sensitize mm. uh, law enforcement and security agencies and also in turn um, the security agencies can be able to air out their views mm. and also share with us mm. uh, their concerns. Secondly, by way of recommendation, um, uh, is to amend some of the regressive and somewhat oppressive laws in the mm. country. My colleagues have mentioned the NGO Act. It has good intentions. Mm. It was a very good law, mm. and uh, I think it's due for review probably next year because we are working very closely with the NGO Bureau Indeed. and NGO Forum to, to review the laws. So there is need to review or amend some of these somewhat repressive laws so that NGOs and human rights defenders can be able to work uh, in a more 
um, conducive environment so that because ultimately we are all serving uh, the citizenry mm. of the country and we are all citizens of this country. And indeed, let's continue fast tracking that law that will go a long way in protecting the rights of the human rights defenders. We need it, yes, as soon as yesterday. My name is Rami Busik and of course we've crowned this conversation. I've largely been talking to Hassan Shire. He is the executive director for Defend Defenders and also the chairperson for African Defenders. Marita Mogasha was also here with us. She is also coming in from the Human Rights Center. She's actually working as the program officer in charge of research and training in that organization. And lastly, we did have Robert Chirenga. He is the executive director for the National Coalition uh, for Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. Robert, we do have a few seconds. I'll give you a few last pointers to talk to members of the public or even the powers that be as we close this show. Mm. Thank you, Romeo. My concluding remarks would mm. be on the obligation of all citizens, that mm. we all as citizens have a responsibility to protect and promote human rights. Mm. But the primary responsibility mm. goes to the state. Mm. Secondly, whenever you are demanding for your rights, mm. know that for every right there is a corresponding responsibility or a duty. Indeed. You can't talk about poor service delivery when you are evading or you are not paying taxes. Indeed. You can't talk about a lack of a clean health environment when you call littering the uh, the, the, the roads with plastics mm. or throwing all kinds of rubbish anywhere. Indeed. So we all have rights, but there are corresponding duties and obligations. Indeed. Uh, Hassan Shah was also requesting for a few seconds. I just want to take Indeed. this opportunity yes. also to thank the Ugandan government mm. uh, because our program, we have been here for 16 years. Indeed. And it's a pan African program. We are their friends, not their enemies. Exactly. Mm. So the K Kampala. Is the first Ubuntu hub city we establish it, mm. where all human rights defenders, and that's what I want to underline, mm. all human rights defenders, anywhere from Libya, from Somalia, from Ethiopia, from uh, Zimbabwe, anywhere mm. they can arrive here and, and, and get rejuvenated, mm. retrain it, protect it, go to high studies, mm. and live in peaceful back to their homes and contribute Indeed. to the situation. So we have we must also say that thank mm. you. And also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, during the UBR process, mm. the entire department came and supported the dialogue. And two civil society were offered to be part of the Ugandan delegation. Indeed. I think we have to also say that, you know, that that's good. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen and lady, for joining us for this very pertinent conversation on this International Human Rights Day. Indeed. Let's continue for striking that law that will go a long way in protecting the rights of the human rights defenders in this country beyond and fur. And uh, that's what we are saying right here on NTV Uganda. My name is Rome Busiku. NTV at one is coming to you shortly in a few. We'll be right back. <laughs>